first speaker is the winner of the Joseph A. Burton Forum Award. That award is to recognize outstanding contributions to the public understanding or resolution of issues involving the interface of physics and society. The award actually is $5,000 and a certificate citing the contributions of the recipient and an allowance to come to this meeting and uh, give a talk. The, the award, Joseph A. Burton Forum Award, is named in recognition of the many contributions of Joseph Burton to the society and to the APS as its treasurer. This year's winner is Professor Robert Jaffe. And this is the citation on his award for bringing a physics perspective into policy discussions in academia and government over the last half century. From the development of the Stanford workshops on social and political issues, to influential work on policy <clears throat> and education regarding <clears throat> excuse me, energy critical elements and climate. Uh, just briefly, although you're going to hear more from himself, <clears throat> Bob Jaffe is the Jane and Otto Morningstar Professor of Science at MIT. In addition to his groundbreaking research on quarks and the substructure of matter, Bob has dedicated much of his career to physics education and outreach, beginning as a graduate student in the late 1960s and culminating in the publication of his award-winning textbook, on the physics of energy in 2018. And he's been awarded the forum's 2022 Burton Award in recognition of efforts at the interface of physics and society, which he will talk about today. Thank you, Bob. Would you come up? And we will hit start. Well, thanks very much, Gerald. I appreciate your introduction. Uh, this is the first time I've given the roughly biographical talk I've given untold numbers of physics talks and talks about my outreach and educational activities, but I've never given a biographical talk, so this will be an adventure. Uh, let me be begin by thanking the APS Forum on, Fo on Physics and Society for the honor of receiving this year's award and for the chance to talk a bit about the work on which the award was based. As you can see from the citation, the work refers to many activities over the past 50 years. not to a single event or creation. So my talk will cover some of those episodes which I chose or felt forced, when I chose or felt forced to reach out from the rarefied world of theoretical particle physics to engage with the problems of the wider world. Many physicists of my generation who were born after World War II and were adolescents during the chaotic 1960s were particularly disturbed by the upheaval going on around them early in their careers. Some abandoned fundamental research entirely, and many who remained have had careers that were rather schizophrenic, like mine, sometimes totally absorbed in compelling research, and at other times drawn back into the events and opportunities in the wider world of policy, outreach, and education. This result is illustrated in the sketch on the next slide. <laughs> uh, when I titled this talk, No Simple Trajectory, I struggled for an image that might give some reflection of this. I ended up with a kind of snakes and ladders picture with uh, physics activities on the left being crowded out by other activities on the right. Uh, nevertheless, this shows the parallel trajectories of fundamental research and public service from my college days to the present. I think today I'll focus on two episodes. One, Swapsy at the bottom of the uh, pile, uh, and the other, the physics of energy at the top. Um, Swapsy because the history might interest you, and because it taught, it taught me some lessons that I carried with me throughout my career. And furthermore, it may be useful to relate to a younger generation in the present time of crisis. And the physics of energy, because it addresses the potential catastrophes that threaten humankind here in the 21st century. I got my first degree in physics in 1968. 
a chaotic year in America and around the world. It was a time not unlike the present when I and many young people were unable to ignore the upheaval taking place around us. On the other hand, 1968 was a brilliant time in particle physics. Quarks were front and center, and the puzzles posed by the weak interactions were coming into sharp focus. Furthermore, QCD lurked on the horizon. I was torn between the lure of basic research and the sense that as a physicist and a citizen, I had some responsibility to act in the public sphere. In the spring of 1968, I was asked to give a speech at Princeton's graduation coming up in June. Not surprisingly, I sought to understand what was happening in, to my grad, in the world that my graduating class was about to enter. Graduation came literally five days after Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in Los Angeles. But other events in 1968 were equally or even more disturbing. Martin Luther King was assassinated in April. The Tet Offensive in January destroyed the myth that America was winning the war in Vietnam. The so-called Prague Spring was unfolding across Eastern Europe while violent protests were taking place in Paris and other European capitals. And close by at Columbia University, hundreds of protesters and police were injured uh, in repeated confrontations. In all, it was an alarming time to graduate from college. In retrospect, possibly as alarming as today. At the same time, I entered the world of particle physics and soon realized that a revolution was underfoot, underway. As I mentioned earlier, quarks and current algebra hinted at impending breakthroughs in the theory of the strong force, and analogous ideas were reshaping electroweak interactions. Then, in the summer of 1968, at the 14th International Conference on High Energy Physics in Vienna, an MIT-Stanford collaboration reported new data from the SLAC electron accelerator showing the first evidence of Bjorkane scaling, the fact that all these points lie on this roughly the same curve, which we now understand to be tantamount to the discovery of physical quarks. It was an exciting time to be heading off to graduate school at Stanford. First, I went to the, Europe to study at the Niels Bohr Institute in the summer and found myself meeting regularly in the student club in Copenhagen with Eastern European students who were for the first time traveling around Europe and discussing and arguing about the virtues of different economic and political systems. Finally, I returned to the United States and drove across country uh, at the same time that demonstrators were disrupting the Democratic Convention you know, in Illinois. When I arrived at Stanford, I fell in with a group of scientists, mostly physicists, who saw the crises of 1968 as a call to become involved in the world of politics and policy. A key figure and an inspiration for our group was Marty Pearl, who later won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the Taon. Marty was collaborating with other physicists in what was known as the March 4th Movement, a project started by a group of scientists and engineers on the East Coast. Parenthetically, uh, the March 4th movement led more or less directly to the formation of the APS Forum on Physics and Society and to the birth of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Our group at Stanford was particularly focused on ways to continue activities beyond the formal activities that had been scheduled for the, for the day of March 4th, 1969. What came out of this was a program called the Stanford Workshops on Political and Social Issues, which is known affectionately as SWAPSI. SWAPSI was created and led by students. Its aim was to actively engage Stanford students in study and outreach on urgent social and political issues, often centered around science. SWAPSI created and sponsored between 10 and 20 four-credit workshops at Stanford each term well into the 1980s. Here to set the tone and illustrate the artistic creativity of the time 
are images of the front of the Squapsi catalogs from the terms of the fall term of 1968 mm -hmm. and the summer term of 1970. Squapsi was a novel format. Students were expected to go beyond classroom study and take constructive action in the world outside the university. Swapsi workshops published and advocated from influential handbooks on air pollution and public transportation in the Bay Area to testimony in Sacramento on the effects of logging in urban counties like the Southern Peninsula south of San Francisco. The program was created without the knowledge of Stanford University by repurposing, or I might say subverting, a policy that had allowed faculty to sponsor half-credit seminars on any topic whatsoever. The Swapsi organizers gained this opportunity by enlisting sympathetic professors to sponsor workshops led by themselves, or more likely by their postdoctoral fellows or advanced graduate students. The first time that Stanford administration heard of Swapsi was literally on registration day in the fall of 1969, when the first Swapsi catalogs announcing a dozen four-credit workshops for that term were handed out from bridge tables at registration. The Swapsi program was created by three students, a Stanford undergraduate, Joyce Kobayashi, who was also the uh, president of the student body, and two SLAC graduate students, Joel Premack and myself. Here's a a pastiche of the titles of the workshops, of some of the 20 workshops from winter of 1970. Notice how many of them remain relevant today. From healthcare delivery to arms control and disarmament, from university investment policies to the technology of participatory democracy, and even housing crises in San Francisco and on the Mid Peninsula. So what lessons do I draw from this Swapsi project? First of all, to use a word that's in vogue now in the 21st century, we felt we had a sense of agency back then, of opportunity and empowerment. We did not conceive of ourselves as victims. We thought of ourselves as actors. We didn't ask Stanford to set up Swapsi. Furthermore, Stanford's administration was notoriously in no, need, in no mood to listen to students in those days anyway. A, a second lesson, and intimately related to the first, uh, to paraphrase a famous remark by Admiral Grace Hoop, uh, Hopper, uh, we found it easier to ask forgiveness than to get permission. But an important qualification of this vote is that you'd better be sure that you're acting correctly to anticipate what changes an institution needs and can tolerate and can accept, and then by your success, earn forgiveness. A another lesson that emerged from our work is that Swapsi powerfully emerged from the ground up. It was driven by passion, not from the top down driven by a bureaucracy. And it confirmed my suspicion that bottom-up works when top-down does not. That's not to say we had no support. We had no institutional support. But Swapsi's organizers sought and found powerful allies and enablers. In addition to Marty Pearl, who I already mentioned, Sid Drell, who a lot, what, we had support from Sid Drell, who tolerated his students, in this case, Joel and me, taking time away from our thesis research for the Swapsi project. From Pief Panofsky, the director of Slack, who allowed access to Slack resources, including government-owned Xerox machines at Slack, on which we copied literally thousands of announcements and the catalogs that were handed out at registration. Another was Lincoln Moses, a rather thoughtful and distinguished stat statistician who was then Stanford's dean of graduate students, who played an important role in encouraging and mentoring Joyce Kobayashi. Another example uh, is Dave Abernathy, one of several young professors uh, who helped us with essential funding from their own discretionary funds at the very beginning of the project. 
Dave actually remained closely associated with Swapsy for many years into the early 1990s. And finally, remarkably, from the Ford Foundation, which we approached and found would fund a proposal from three students with no particular uh, pedigree, providing Swapsy with resources and with legitimacy at a critical time, very early in its history. Another legacy of Swapsy uh, is the people who were helped and inspired by the program. Often they were leaders of workshops, as well as students. The leaders in, who were nudged by Swapsy into distinguished lifelong careers at the interface of science and society uh, were many, and I'll just mention two examples. One is Frank von Hippel, uh, who led a workshop on science advice for Congress and the public, and Ned Groth, who had a very successful workshop on air pollution in the Bay Area that led to an influential handbook. Frank, as you may know, went on to found and lead for a long time Princeton's program on science and global security. And Ned, as you may know, is a lifelong environmentalist and consumer advocate who for many years was a senior scientist at Consumers Union, which is the parent of Consumer Reports. But back to physics. Joel and I remained immersed in particle physics. By 1972, Swapsy was in the hands of other students and leaders. Meanwhile, the quark revolution that had begun with Slack's deep and elastic scattering experiments was rapidly replacing the old S matrix paradigm of the strong interactions. This was described eloquently by David Gross in his remarks at the very beginning of this conference. As I finished my degree in 1972, the pieces of QCD had been assembled, but quarks had never been seen. And the paradox, which went by the name of quark confinement, was very much on my mind. How could quarks behave like weakly interacting particles within protons, but never be observed in isolation? I had exciting discussions about confinement with Ken Johnson from MIT, who was on sabbatical at Slack in 1971 and 72. And influenced by Ken, and by Francis Lowe, in 1972, I headed off to MIT as a postdoc. I soon became part of a wonderful group, including Ken, Charles Thorne, Alan Chodos, Vicky, and Vicky Weiskopf, in developing a model of confined quarks that became known as the MIT bag model which fascinated me for more than a decade and led me into many other areas of particle physics research. Although I settled into research and teaching at MIT, the, the external world kept intruding. I'd like to mention a few of the projects that I undertook during those middle years before turning to the project that capped all of this off. Uh, here's a sample list of some of the things that went on in my career at MIT. Uh, a couple of them, like chairing MIT's faculty, faculty and helping to found the uh, School of Science and Engineering at the Lahore University of Management and Science, would occupy an hour's talk themselves. And I'm going to set those aside, but mention briefly the project of building an organization called Symposium at MIT and the project of uh, working on a study under the aegis of a uh, panel on public affairs of the APS. Symposium at MIT was an attempt by a group of faculty to bridge the divides among MIT's several schools, including science, MIT has five schools, science, engineering, humanities, management, and architecture and planning. And maintaining connections between those schools has been notoriously difficult. Cynthia Wolf, a literary critic, and I had an idea and led a group that included a chemist, a distinguished chemist, Bob Silby, and a distinguished historian, Tom Kuhn. We organized a program modeled on Greek symposia. The idea was that a group of about 20 faculty by the way, I should say symposium is a word whose etymology comes from sim, which is in the Greek 
realm of the word with, and potion or poson, which means drinking alcohol. So symposium means a party where you drink alcohol. And uh, as Plato pointed out, you also philosophized, danced, sung, and ate. Um, the idea was that a group of about 20 faculty would get together monthly to enjoy good food and good drink, preceded by real homework, and followed by hours of seminar and discussion across the boundaries of schools and disciplines. Symposiums strengthened the bonds of MIT's faculty community. It was much beloved, and it thrived for several decades, and it may be soon reborn. So, symposium, like Swapsy, started from the bottom up. It was unauthorized, but was dedicated, and it was dedicated and independent faculty that made it happen. And as you can see, if you can read the screen, a couple of these symposiums, at least, involved very distinguished activities. Uh, the one I'm pointing to on the top is Oliver Hart's description of the work on corporate economics. He was an assistant professor at MIT and went on to win a Nobel Prize in later years. And of course, Tom Kuhn having uh, a symposium on his reflections on the methodology of his studies of history uh, was, a, was a striking event. Um, my second short story regards the, my activities with the Panel on Public Affairs, POPA. Um, which I joined in 2007, shortly after I began work on the book project that I'll come back to in a few minutes. Since about 2005, Pope has produced high quality, rapid response studies that provide advice and information on issues with the physics component to both the public and the government. The covers of some of those swaps, the Pope studies are listed here so that you can get a flavor for what they do. As I studied renewable energy for the book I was writing, I began to realize that deploying these technologies, these renewable energy technologies at a scale that is required uh, in order to have an impact on the world's energy issues, required large quantities of rare or and or unusual chemical elements. Noble metals that are used in catalysis uh, unusual semi-metals, gallium, germanium, tellurium, etc., that are used in photovoltaics, and rare earth elements that are used in the, the uh, permanent magnets in wind turbines, and of course the unusual elements that appear in uh, lithium battery sto energy storage. Uh, it seemed to me this was a problem. Of, there was impending problems about resourceability that were resource availability that were unappreciated, and it was a natural subject for a POPA study. After discussions and refinement, uh, my proposal was accepted. I was a newbie on, on uh, POPA so that it was all a learning experience for me. Uh, Francis Slakey, who was then the APS liaison to POPA, helped us set up a collaboration with the Material Research Society and put together a terrific interdisciplinary team to carry out the study. Um, among this team are the state geologist of Nevada, an expert on mining technology in Nevada, several famous economic geologists, prospectors, uh, chemists and experts on the supply chain for rare materials. It was a wonderful group. The study led to an, inf an inter influential report that was well timed to appear just when the quote rare earth crisis unquote of 2011 was catching the attention of Congress and the executive branch and the public. So it was very well timed. Uh, I'm going to turn now to the last topic on my agenda. Um, which is uh, sorry, um, which occurred um, much later in my career, namely in the early years of this century. So I had already had a long research career since the early 1970s into the early 2000s. And uh, in my humble opinion, <laughs> Uh, research in theoretical physics is a young person's domain. And I thought the time was right for a more ambitious project. I become increasingly frustrated and distressed at the level of discussion of 
uh, the low level of the public discussion on energy and climate issues. And furthermore, I was at MIT with terrific students and a platform to influence the wider world. It was a wonderful opportunity, especially because MIT had just started its energy initiative, which was led by an old friend from graduate school days at Stanford, Ernie Moniz. At the, just at the time that I was thinking about this, I learned that a colleague of mine, Wadi Taylor, Washington Taylor, who is a another theoretical physicist, actually a string theorist, considerably more abstract and theoretical than myself, was interested in, uh, had similar interests. And uh, together, we launched an effort to develop and implement and teach and promote a new undergraduate course on energy sources, uses, and systems. With tenure, we did not have to ask permission but we did ask for and got support from MIT's energy initiative and from several heads of MIT's uh, physics department. And furthermore, shortly after we started, MIT approved an energy studies degree program, which needed exactly a course like this uh, at its foundation to teach the science behind energy studies. I think I should explain why we thought a course on the physics of energy was so important. Of course, as you know, energy is a primary concept and organizing principle in physics. Physicists and chemists and biologists as well often first attempt to understand the dynamics of a system by following the flow of energy through the system, from the selection of the vacuum state in quantum field theory to the dynamics of hurricanes and of climate, of climax forests in ecology. Second, and most compelling for Wadi and me, finding and developing de and deploying renewable, carbon-free energy sources has emerged as a paramount crisis for humanity in the 21st century. Indeed, a course on the physics of energy also links physics to the real world. It's a natural capstone course integrating all the classic topics in an undergraduate physics curriculum, from mechanics through electrodynamics to statistical and quantum physics, even fluid dynamics, all in the context of real-world problems. Finally, it provides the fundamental science background for students pursuing an energy certificate or degree. We started to plan our course and began to look for an appropriate textbook, which would have made our project much simpler. To our surprise, we couldn't find a text at the right level and with the right style, so we started to generate lecture notes. And as often happens, this led finally to a textbook of our own, which appeared 12 years after we started the project uh, in 2018. And that's the front cover of the textbook. Actually, our course filled a gap in the pedagogical spectrum. So here's an image of the pedagogical spectrum. Um, on the uh, left-hand side of the spectrum, in the infrared, lies physics for poets, courses that advertise themselves with having few equations, few derivations, no equations, they cover energy and the environment. They often mix physics, economics, and policy regulation. Uh, and they often take an explicit point of view about the uh, implementation of energy technologies. A good example is the Richard Muller's course at Brook Berkeley on the physics for future presidents. At the other end of the spectrum, in the ultraviolet, lie specialized science and engineering groups. Sorry, this is. Now, going way past where I was. Uh, Three minutes. Thank you. Lie uh, specialized courses for, on advanced technologies that you find in the engineering and advanced science curricula of many universities. We imagined a course uh, that would lie in the center of the spectrum, be physics centric, a technical survey for undergraduates with a, with a physics and mathematics background. Uh, and that would start from fundamentals the way physics courses uh, standardly do 
but would be broadly accessible to uh, university students in the hard sciences and in engineering. One key point about our course was the, the, book, the course and the book were limited to science, avoiding economics and policy, and in particular, advocacy. In fact, we realized from the outset that economic, political, and regulatory issues are thornier problems than those problems presented by science and technology. However, we had strong reasons to stick to the science. First, a solid science-based understanding of a basic of an, issue, of an issue is a precondition for a productive economic and policy debate. Second, the policy, economic, and political factors and social factors changed so fast that our book would have been outdated and obsolete before it was even published. And finally, we wanted everyone to use our book, not just the people who agreed with our advocacy, because just the ones that would be put off by taking a position are the ones that need to learn the basic science so they can participate in the discussion. So we struggled with how to organize our, t our book. Uh, sorry, this is moving because the board that I've got my hands on is clicking. So there are lots of issues in trying to organize a course like this, what, how to draw the boundary between fundamental and applied science, between engineering and fundamental science, between engineering and design. and. Uh, this, this presented us with a lot of pedagogical problems, which I'm going to leave aside at the moment. Uh, I can just give you a feeling for the book by flashing some of the uh, illustrations from the book, which range from the Rankine thermal cycle uh, to the absorption spectrum of carbon dioxide in the infrared, the neutron cycle in a nuclear fission reactor, and the uh, dynamics of control of electric energy grids just to give you a, a, a small flavor. Um, so uh, this takes me to the end of my talk. Um, if I have a lesson from this, it's that independence, agency, and bottom-up processes work well. It helps to be able to make friends who can expedite your work, and it helps to have a secure position it's a wonderful reason for tenure so that at a later stage in your career, you can do what you like. And I'll close just by flashing the images, the pictures of many of the people who were collaborators and mentors who helped me along the way in these many projects. Thank you. So um, we have five minutes to ask Professor Jaffe, some questions. If you're in the room and you want to ask a question, you need to come get this microphone. And I don't see anything from my online people yet. So, okay. Susan? I think it's on now. So even if that was your first biographical talk, I think you did a good job. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's a little concerning that the stuff you did in Swapsea in 1968 and 69, in those headlines and t course titles could be used again now, all of them, I think. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, it's a good question. I, thank you. I think the, my thoughts on that is that one, ha one can really divide the problems facing the world into problems that can be solved and problems that have to be managed. There are problems that we will, may never solve, but each generation in turn has to cope with the uh, difficulty of trying to make peace with those problems on its own terms. And uh, I think that the struggle to understand and act on those problems is itself enlightening and informative and has a differential effect on the well-being of the people uh, that are served by those processes. The, the fact that I, I can give you one brief example, the logging on the Mid Peninsula, there, there, there are still problems with destruction of habitat, but the effect of the workshop studying logging on the west side of the mountains that run down the southern peninsula from California 
actually help prevent the development of uh, those forests and pasture lands into more housing south of Half Moon Bay. One last question, and please use the microphone. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, from your perspective, what would you say is the target student audience for the Physics of Energy book? The reason I ask is because I do teach Physics for Future Presidents at George Washington University. I have used Muller's book, which I found to be significantly too low level, even for my political science students. So I have raised up the level of mathematics to the algebra-based kind of thing. But I doubt they would survive your book. And you know, you could say it's a, an elective for physics majors and science majors, but they might be wanting to take nuclear physics or atomic physics. So is it an elective, and who is it targeted for, and who takes it? So at MIT, we're very fortunate that everybody has to take a year of calculus and a year of calculus-based physics. So we were fortunate to have political science students and management students, future economists and the like, taking our course, which is a terrific advantage. I understand that at most universities, uh, the majority of students who are not hard science majors or engineering majors do not take university-level calculus and physics. For those people and uh, faculty who are trying to develop courses for them, I think our book is a desk reference. It provides the underlying physics formalism from basic ideas that are understandable to any physics professor that lead to a coherent picture of energy sources like coal or wind, with the hydrodynamics of wind turbines, for example. And although the concepts and the calculations in the book on, say, wind turbines would only be suited to students with an engineering or physics background, um, the person who's teaching the course can translate that into something that's more useful for his or her students. Um, as for electives, um, some students, when they're seniors and juniors, are, are looking for to take the most advanced course possible. At MIT, they take quantum field theory as an elective. Um, some students, on the other hand, are looking for a course that helps them orient what they've done to life in the real world. And those students are natural, are natural uh, input to our course. The, the course attracts between 15 and 25 students, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, on a regular basis. Okay. Uh, that's all we have time for. Thank you very much, Professor Jeffrey.